בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. Uh, we're uh, back in our Wednesday night shiur, Stump the Rabbi, where you guys ask me some questions. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem gives us the answers. Um, so, Bezat uh, Hashem, hopefully you guys have prepared some questions for us to answer. There's a few really, really interesting chidushim uh, that I uh, learned that Bezat Hashem at some point will uh, we'll discuss, whether in the beginning or in the end, not sure yet. Um, something very interesting, very, very interesting. But uh, anyway, today I actually was uh, planning on taking the rest of the week uh, off, spend some more time with the family, but uh, I got a call, uh, I got a few, excuse me, I got a few reasons that motivated me to uh, have this year tonight. Number one, a few visitors from out of town, but uh, even more so, I got a uh, very disturbing call um, that uh, from uh, from someone that uh, is in a New Rochelle community in New York, and um, I'm sorry, in, uh, yeah, New Rochelle is in New York or in Jersey? I think it's in Jersey. Yeah, no, New York, New York, New Rochelle. I'm losing my mind. Yeah, New Rochelle, and uh, this is the community that uh, had the one particular guy and his family that uh, got infected with the coronavirus uh, and then he traveled once to uh, to Florida and uh, apparently uh, you know the news says oh he didn't touch anyone, he didn't handshake, he didn't cough, he didn't sneeze, he didn't do anything uh, but as soon as he got home uh, him, his family and the entire community have been on quarantine uh, you're not allowed to leave your house apparently uh, uh, or or it's a thousand uh, dollar fine. Uh, people can conduct certain things, but uh, very minimal. Um, and um, a few people in the community got infected because he went to shul and obviously not realizing that he has this virus. And uh, so the the whole community is maybe about a thousand people. That Hashem Yishmol Yatzil. Hashem will uh, have uh, mercy on us, have mercy on them to give them all refuah uh, shlema because it's a it's not an easy uh, situation Rabotai uh, someone sent me a website that tracks the uh, infections of the coronavirus worldwide and unfortunately the numbers continue to grow uh, we're approaching almost 5,000 deaths worldwide uh, although the vast majority of them are in China and then after that it's uh, Italy and Iran still we have cases uh, over 1100 cases of uh, infected people in America confirmed cases and the numbers continue to grow just a, a few days ago it was 400 uh, and um, we have some in Israel unfortunately the number is uh, 79 confirmed cases Baruch Hashem no one has died uh, and no one will die. There was actually a few uh, Mekubalim that uh, did a special zgula yesterday, uh, flew over the city, made special prayers. Uh, it's a uh, special uh, zgula that uh, last time it was done was by Rabbi Udaftaya. Uh, and uh, by praying and doing certain special prayers for the nation of Israel while you're in the, uh, approaching the four corners of the, of the land. So, um, point is that anyone that has a uh, understanding of uh, what's really on the line is worried. Not necessarily worried that this is the end of the world, but that simply a lot of people are going to die. Um, and even more so, the virus is, the on is not the only reason people will die. And that's what I was telling the uh, the person that I was speaking to from New Rochelle. He has been under quarantine, uh, you know, for some time. He said, I, I, I can't believe this is actually happening. Um, and uh, it's a, to say the least, it's uncomfortable, this whole situation, for anybody, even if you're not sick, to know that uh, to get delivery of food, you pretty much have to do it at a specific time during the day. Why? Because you can't leave, you can't go, you have to get delivery, and the delivery is not coming whenever you feel like it, because there's so much higher demand now. 
Uh, it's a nightmare, to say the least. So the Shur will, uh, will, uh, will go out to the Refuah Shlema of that community. Um, also for Refuah Shlema for uh, Maidi Rabbanit, uh, Levana Batsara, uh, David Ben Asriya, Doris Bajora, uh, Esther Bat Zipora, Elisheva Chaya Bat Sarah, Serach Bat Batya, Batya Bat uh, Sarah, uh, Dvora Bat Mercedes, and uh, all of Am Yisrael Bezrat Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. So to continue with the situation as far as uh, what's going on in the world, Rabotai, uh, the situation is deteriorating because what's happening now is that it's not just the virus spreading like uh, everyone hoped it wouldn't, uh, but uh, even worse, the, everyone is panicking, especially when it comes to government. Now in North Korea, there was one guy, one person that got it, they killed him on the spot. Now, of course, you're going to say, you know, they shot him, they just shot the guy. Now, of course, yeah, yeah, it's North Korea, they kill people anyway. Yeah, okay, but what's to say that the same thing is not going to happen in your hometown? Oh, no, it's illegal. It's illegal until it's legal. It was illegal to burn people until the Holocaust. Then it became a mitzvah for them to burn people, especially if they were Jewish. It's illegal until it's legal. There's no faith in human justice. There's no faith in there. There's no, uh, don't, don't have any emunah baguim. And the reality is, is that the people are panicking, the governments are panicking, because no one wants to die. And uh, if I was in the stock market business still today but if I was still in it I would be a very rich person now and the reason why is because what we said about a month ago of what's going to happen to the market today happened the market for the first time in I don't know six years I look at it uh, I don't know every few days because there's like 500 messages. Oh, look what's happening. Look what's, eventually I respond. Market's crashing. It's down 20% from the highs. Which means it's a bear market. Meaning everything that we said a few weeks ago that the, the show is over, confirmed. It's over. Bull market's over. How far it's going to go? Unfortunately, Whoever's in the market, you haven't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen nothing yet. Part of the reason is because of the way people are addressing this issue, the, the panic, the, uh, the way people react when they don't have a God. When they think that the solution is in their hands and they don't have a solution, what else is there to do other than panic? What else is there to do? The people that panic don't have any emunah in Hashem. And the people that have emunah in Hashem don't panic. Now, how do you not panic? You know that it's in Hashem's hands. Whether you live or you die, it's in Hashem's hands every day. Not just because of coronavirus vi visited. Wait, you think coronavirus is the only reason that uh, everyone's life's on the line? That's it? You are going to die otherwise? How come my uh, cousin died a few weeks ago, 48? How come? He didn't have coronavirus. He had a drug problem. Not coronavirus. How come he died? How come his brother died two years ago? He didn't have coronavirus and not a drug problem either. He had a scooter problem. How come? How come so many people I know have died over the last several years? I haven't spoken to any of these people, but the point is that from my high school, my high school, I think at least 30 people for my graduating class died. Young guys, young girls. How come? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu decided that it was over for them. Because Hashem Shemi doesn't decide the same for us or you. But we have to give him a reason. Corona is just Hashem showing you there's just an added danger in the world. Now, 
the way people are reacting to it is simply a testament to their faith in God. When you have no faith in God, you simply panic, lose your mind, start doing all types of crazy things, like kill people in the middle of the street. Or there when they board up people in their houses in China. And so on and so forth. Now, the situation is not going to get any better anytime soon. And the reason why is the following. For any of those people that when I first announced that the, uh, in my opinion, at the time it was an opinion, today it's a fact, the market bull run is over and the market's going to crash. And by market, I mean everything, every asset class. There's nothing safe. Not currency, not precious metals, not oil, not uh, any type of other commodity, uh, not stocks, not bonds. It's, that's what's in the Gemara. Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin, says that a Mashiach is not going to come until everything is the same price, meaning everything goes to nothing. Now, is that going to happen in the next few weeks? No, I don't, I don't think so. But that's again my opinion. Before Mashiach comes, for sure it's happening. I'm just hoping that we have more time. Why? Because there's a lot of precious neshamot. A lot of precious neshamot that we still want to help them. We still want to get them close to HaKadosh Baruch before Mashiach comes. Why? Once Mashiach comes, there's no more time. There's no like tshuva once you see Mashiach is here. There's no tshuva anymore. Just like there was no conversion, no uh, new additions to Am Yisrael at the time of uh, David Melech, David Shlomo Melech, because it was obvious who the winner is. Same thing. Source, Gemara Masechet, Avodah Zara, page 4a. Now, point being is Rabotai, that the market is reacting in a way that people know how to react when they don't have a God. They pretty much sell everything because they are assuming it's going to be lower value tomorrow. But there's always a guy that says, no, 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 it's going to rebound. So when I first said the market's over, people said, no, but what if they find a cure? Then the market's going to skyrocket again, right? Yeah, it will. It will. They will. It will skyrocket when they find a cure. Problem is, it's not going to happen. Not anytime soon. And even if they find a cure, that initial skyrocketing will just be a fake out. Why? Because then people are going to realize, okay, let's say hypothetically speaking, Be'ezat Hashem even. They find a cure tomorrow. Tomorrow they find. Now, what, what, I'll why they find a cure. We don't have a vested interest in them not finding a cure. I wish they find a cure. Let's say they found a cure right now while we're doing the shoe. They say, Rabotai, we found a cure, and uh, we're going to start mass producing it. To bring it to the market. To bring it to even the initial stages of the market. Not the whole market. The initial stages of the market will take them somewhere in the neighborhood of two years to produce. Put all the stuff together, all the chemicals together, the labs together, the machines together to make all the vials, all the pills, or whatever it is. To make all the stuff takes time, takes money, takes effort. What do you think? It's because you have a cure that said everybody, okay guys, you have nothing to worry about. Go and uh, you know, hug everyone from now on. Anyone you see, hug them. Give them a nice kiss too. What do you think? To take, to, to, what, even if you have a cure, It'll take a long time for it to get to market. And even when it gets to market, it's not everyone. It's the first stage. So that's why Rabotai, when people ask, oh, how come they're testing so many more people in China, in Hong Kong, than they're testing in America? Like in Hong Kong right now, they're testing something in a neighborhood of like 55,000 people a week. Like some, you know, a ridiculously high number. In America, it's like 400. You know why? They have a billion and a half people that work for free, pretty much. We have practically zero that work for free. No one works for free. 
Unless it's Bezat Hashem, you volunteer. Other than that, no one works for free. And even that's kind of starting to end soon. Well, it's, it's a reality. There's money. It costs money. It costs money. And also people. Also skill set. A lot of the people that are willing to work for free in America, you wouldn't want to hire them even for money. America is not exactly known as the most skilled country in the world. In China, on the other hand, the average guy is very skilled, much more skilled than people in America. Hence the reason why there's so much more manufacturing done over there by the best companies in the world. It's not just the cost. People think, no, everyone does their business in China because the, uh, the cost is cheaper. First of all, the cost is not that much cheaper if you're talking about big numbers. Number two, it's just that the skill set over there is much better. So, the point is that even if you found a cure and you wanted to produce it, guess what? Who do you think China is going to take care of first? America? Israel? Uh, uh, Iran? Uh, Bangladesh or themselves? They got almost two billion of their own they got to take care of first. So that's another issue. It'll take a while for this thing. Meaning, Akadosh Baruch Hu, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Shemo, He has put us in a situation where we are all going to have to arrive at the conclusion that En Od Milvado, there's nothing else but Him. There's nothing to rely but Him. There's nothing to do without Him. And that's just a reality. There's nothing you can do without Him. Every single person will get to that understanding at some point. Hopefully it's before they die. But the point is, Rabotai, is that even if the market initially started booming because somebody announced there's a cure, reality check comes in sometimes a day later sometimes a month later it's not hitting the market it won't hit the market somebody pretty much gives out the uh, the uh the big secret lets everyone uh, know about the elephant in the room by the way yeah we have the cure but it's going to be a really long time before anyone actually gets it yeah we have the vaccine but it's going to be a long time before we anyone gets it and a vaccine is not the same thing as a cure vaccine is for all the healthy people not the sick people Still does nothing for the sick people. Now the good news is, there's not, percentage-wise, there's not that many people dying. But unfortunately, they're still dying. There's still a lot of people dying. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu is cleaning up the world and in different ways in order to wake us up. And He's giving us a clock that we're not so familiar with. Chazal tell us that before Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to speed up time. What does it mean, speed up time? Doesn't mean that there's going to be less than 24 hours a day. Doesn't mean that the 60 seconds in your minute are going to go faster, but rather things in the world will move faster. If you notice, the way we handle things today are much, much faster. You know, in the old days, when you want to log on the internet, it would be 15, 20 minutes before you went on the first website. Today, if it takes you less than three sick seconds, you're already complaining to the company. Hey, this it's internet's garbage. This is just below garbage. You guys should go bankrupt. Why? It took me three and a half seconds, a whole three and a half seconds to go to a website. Or sometimes they call you, listen, I think your website needs to be redone. Why? It takes two seconds to open. I don't know. This is garbage. It's horrible. Horrible. I don't know. I was like, I felt like I was getting old for it to open. Something's wrong with your video. Why? What's wrong with it? I don't know. It takes like 20 seconds to load. It's horrible. It's terrible. I don't understand. 20 seconds? What do you think? Are people going to wait for you? 20 seconds? What kind of company is this? Are you guys real? Are you guys real? Are you a real organization? 20 seconds to load? And God forbid it takes a minute. Hashem Yishmo V'yatzi. Start sending you hate mail. Like you're Hamas. Because we're used to everything speed. But it's not like that. It's not, that's not normal life. It's not normal life. Normal life is you call your friend, he doesn't pick up. You call another time. That's normal life. Today, text message. You don't even call anybody. Five seconds later, if he doesn't respond, question mark. Are you okay? Is everything okay? 
Are you there? You know how many are you there's I get a day? Are you there? Is everything okay? Did I do something? I don't even know you. What did you do something? Why? You didn't get an instant response. Sick generation. Sick. Sick. You go to a restaurant. Every restaurant, if it's busy, you're definitely going to find one yeller. Every restaurant you go to, one yeller. What's the yeller? Ah, this place is garbage. I'm not coming here again. Not coming here again. 15 minutes, we're waiting for the food. Buddy, it takes that much time to cook the food. What do you want? You want fast to go eat McDonald's. It's pre-made. What do you want? 15 minutes. The guy's complain. hates the place. Why? It took 15 minutes to get the food. Starts cursing out everybody. The form generation, Ba'ale Mum. But nonetheless, Rabotai Karim, this also happens in the rest of the uh, world that we live in. Technology is something that allows Hashem to make it look realistic. But uh, we see the technology developments are much faster. Uh, people are much quicker to press the button. People are much quicker to end relationships. People are much quicker to start removing body parts. People are much quicker to start relationships. People are much quicker to do everything. Just on the way here, I spoke to a young woman that uh, is, uh, was scheduled to have a surgery that, uh, to remove a body part. Why? Because it's possible, it's possible that maybe, maybe it has cancer. Maybe. Not sure. But already the doctor said, listen, maybe. It might have cancer. Maybe. We're not really sure. It's not conclusive. We should remove it. It's like me saying, oh, listen. Maybe, maybe you're ugly. I should chop off your head off. Maybe you're ugly. My taste, according to, my, according to me, you're ugly. So maybe somebody else agrees with me, you should chop your head off. Like, people are just so quick to remove body parts. <laughs> Same thing happens with relationships. Rabbi, how do I get a get? What happened? Why, why do you want to get divorced? How do I get a get? I, I got to get out of this. I don't know. It's horrible. Horrible. How long are you married? Six months. Shemesh Mo, what happened? Six months, you already hate her? Yeah, yeah, she's the worst. Why? What happened? The meal she cooked yesterday, I, I can't, I can't. Rabbi, if I ever eat this again, I don't know, I think I'm going to die. So you want to get divorced because of the food? She marry a restaurant. <laughs> this is the type of stuff people deal with. Why? We don't believe in fixing. We're not a generation that believes in fixing. We want everything made. Everything perfect. And unfortunately, Rabotai, that is a perfect pattern to a miserable life. If you expect everything to be perfect, I am telling you, you're guaranteed to have a miserable life. Because life is imperfect. Life is imperfect. Relationships are imperfect. All, all things are imperfect. Why? Because it's for us to make it perfect. It's for us to make it better. One of the hints that we have from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that this is His way, this is His doing, He made it imperfect intentionally, is simply by the way we came into this world. One of the most important mitzvot that a Jewish male has is the Brit Milah. Now, a father that doesn't have a brit milah for his son is in a very very problematic situation with Shemaim. but nonetheless when that kid grows up he still has to get a brit milah even if his father chose otherwise like many people did in russia they were scared to do brit milah for different reasons life risk and so on so a lot of russian jews that moved to Eretz israel that wanted to get closer to Akadosh Baruch Hu, had to get brit milah as adults now Anyone that wants to be Jewish has to have a Brit Milah. But then you would ask, wait a minute. Before I cut, I cut this, uh, this body part, before I cut it off, in the most sensitive part of the body, in the scariest part of the body for guys, before I do this, maybe there's another way. Is there another rabbi that says maybe no? Like last week's rabbi. Is there another opinion maybe that says maybe no? Is there uh, maybe uh, leniency on this one? 
No, there's no leniency. You want to be a Jew? You have to have Brit Milah. Now, the problem is that if you do not get a Brit Milah, you go up to Shamayim, Avraham Avinu doesn't recognize you. When you get in home, he takes out the souls that have suffered enough. He takes out the righteous soul, the fin- they finish suffering, he takes them out. But someone has a Brit Milah, or someone that did not do tshuva for wasting seed, he doesn't recognize them. So they stay there. Now you would ask, wait a minute, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is perfect, why did he create us imperfect? Meaning, if you wanted us to have Brit Milah, then why did you create us with the Orla, with the foreskin? What do I need this for? Why do I need to go through this pain? Eight days old, poor kid. Ask him for his opinion at least. Wait for him until he's 12, 13 years old. Ask him, listen, you want to cut it? No? Okay, Kapara. Go, go, go play with your friends. Go pray. Ask him for, no, that's what the feminists and the lefty liberals and all the Torah haters say. Oh, you're violating human rights. Why? Because you're hurting a little baby. You should wait for his opinion. Like this one crazy woman was on television. They actually let these people on television. She has a, a, a organization. People actually give her money somehow. Give her money to run an organization for protecting the rights of babies. Now you would think, wait, protecting the rights of babies, that means no abortions, right? No, 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 no I'm not talking about those rights. I'm not talking about those rights. I'm talking about protecting the rights of babies where she wants to government to change the law and force parents to ask permission from the baby before they change their diaper. Now, when the newscaster heard this, he goes, wait a minute, but the baby doesn't know how to talk. She goes, no, but a mother knows if she has the right or not. <laughs> the guy couldn't help himself and start laughing. <laughs> you're gonna, wait, so you're going to ask this, so maybe the kid doesn't want it, she's going to sit in it for a week straight. The, the level of stupidity in the generation that we have right now is at new highs. And it keeps going higher. Now, we back to the question. If Akadosh Baruch Hu, the King of Kings, wanted us without a foreskin, why did He create us with one? And the reason is to give us a hint at how He created all other creation imperfect. He created us imperfect. Why? In order to have us contribute to the creation. So we become partners. Why, why does He care for us to become partners? Because if He created us perfect, then we would be simply like employees. Now, an employee, Baruch Hashem, I've had many of them, and every single one of them has tortured me. And I can tell you that employees, no matter how much you pay them, they don't care. No matter how much you pay them. If at some point, uh, not sometimes they care, but at some point they don't really care about your business, about your needs, as much as they care about theirs. Why? It's your business. It's not their business. They're just here for the money. The second they get somebody to offer them more money, bye! You pay them $1,000 a day, somebody's willing to pay them $5,000, bye, good to see you, thanks for the experience. Why? <laughs> I'm here for the, I'm not, it's, not my, it's not my company. Yeah, but didn't you enjoy it? Yeah, I enjoyed it, but now I am enjoy, I'm going to enjoy $5,000. I'm going to enjoy it, I enjoyed it so much, I'm going to write you letters about how much I enjoyed it. But I'm going to afford really nice letters because now I'm going to have $5,000 a day. So I'm going to get you with a special paper. 80 pound paper I'm going to get you. That's how much I enjoy it. And I'll come to the uh, honorees and the dinners. I'll come for that. But working here, no. Why? It's not like, uh, I'm going to make more money. Employee is never going to care about your company as much as you do as an owner. Why? It's not his company. But a partner is a different story. Why? He feels it's his. She feels it's her company. She feels it's her business. Even though, even if she only owns or he only owns 1% of it, it's still their 1%. They're acting as if they own the whole 99%. So that means that even if there's difficult times where the partners are not getting any salaries, where the partners are not getting any profits, they stick it out most of the time. Why? It's their business. 
It's my company. If somebody says, where you work? Oh, I have a company. Even if the guy owns a half a percent. It's my company. It's my business. Yeah, my business. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was one of the founders. He's one of the six, first six employees, so he considers himself a founder. <laughs> but the reality is, it's his business. Why? He was a partner. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted us to be partners. So we take care of the creation. He created us in a way where we have a very critical mitzvah, which is to protect our brit. Not only to have a circumcision. That doesn't mean you're protecting your brit by having a circumcision. That, 99% of the cases, you don't have really much of an option. Your parents decided already. But protecting your breed means that you are going to protect it as you grow up. When you start learning that this breed does more than just uh, relieve yourself with uh, you know, things you don't want in your body. Once you mature, you realize this is something that you can use for different reasons. And you are now going to think about, wait a minute, do I want to use it now? Is it allowed to use it now? Not allowed to use it now. Is Hashem going to be happy if I use it now? Or are you not going to be happy? Why are you taking it into consideration? Why? Because you are a partner. You're a partner in creation. You're a partner in protecting this Brit. Because this Brit is the oldest mitzvah we have since the time of Abraham Avinu. It's even before the Matan Torah. So, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us and continues to create us in such a way that on day number eight, and for the parents, it's pretty much day number one. Because they're already worried about the Brit Milah on the first second the kid's born. And you know it's a boy. Is he yellow? He's not yellow. Oh, he's going to be ready? He's not going to be ready. Right, right. He's okay. He's alive. He's good. And the second the kid's born, you're already thinking about the Brit Milah. Already getting ready. The, the, the caterer, the this, the that, the people, inviting, not inviting. Who I'm going to invite? Who I'm not going to invite? Where we're going to do it? Where we're not going to do it? No one really cares about if the baby's going to be okay or not because you're just ready for the Brit Milah. You're so like, excited about something that's going to happen. The reality is, why do you do it? Because your grandparents did it, and your great-grandparents did it, and so on and so forth. All the way to the time of Avraham Avinu. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to be partners in the creation. When you took so much care in order to do something, to continue something we've been doing for thousands of years, Needless to say, you should continue thinking about this before you go out with a non-Jewish person. Before you commit immorality. Before you become homosexual. Before you make your dog your wife also. Before you do all of these things that are technically not natural, but have become natural in this generation. You guys think, oh, it's crazy. It's cra this is natural. For people in people's minds. People think that homosexuality is a natural thing. They don't think there's anything abnormal about it. Now, if you go back to when I was a kid, absolutely abnormal. If somebody was homosexual, they usually hid it from everyone. And eventually, when they came out of the closet, they regretted it. Why? Well, you should stay in the closet. Today, there's no closets. Just walls. Everybody shows their business, and they're proud of it. They have marches. They have marches about their, their abnormality. They don't realize that if their parents were also homosexual, they wouldn't be here. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says it's not natural. But people think it's natural. Why? It all starts with missing the small details. Forgetting about the original agreement that was made over 4,000 years ago with Avraham Avinu of Brit Milah. Now, when we make that commitment to have the Brit Milah, we can make the make commitment to protect our Brit. We can make the commitment to make sure that we're only with our wives. We're only at times we're allowed. We're only going to do things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says allowed. It's mitzvah even to do it. Once we take that into account, we actually start acting like partners. When we act like partners, we get the benefits of the partnership. The same thing goes with creation, the rest of creation. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created a world where nothing is perfect. Marriage is never perfect. Friendship is never perfect. Work is never perfect. Uh, a sandwich is never perfect. 
doing your taxes is not perfect. It's only perfect in your mind until the IRS shows up and tells you, hey, by the way, sir, uh, yeah, you missed a few uh, zeros. It's not perfect, your taxes. It's not perfect. You owe us some more money. Oh, but I thought it was perfect. Yeah, you thought, you thought. You thought. We think we're perfect, but we're not perfect. Why? Kadosh Baruch wants us to contribute to creation. He created things in such a way where we have to contribute. Don't cry about things being not perfect or not going your way. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to go your way. You're supposed to contribute in order for it to go in the direction that it needs to go. If the direction that it needs to go happens to coincide with the direction that you want it to be, Chazakubo, good for you. But if things are going in the way they're supposed to be, which is against the way you want them to be, you're the one that's wrong. If your marriage has a problem, there's something wrong with you, not just the other person. Why? Because a marriage is a full-time job. You're supposed to fix it every day. Yeah, but it didn't break it. No, no, trust me, it's broken. It's broken. It's broken. How do I, how do I know if it's broken? It's permanently broken. Every day needs fixing. Why? She's crying. He's crying. They're crying. Somebody's crying. Somebody's always crying. Or they want to cry. Or they're thinking about crying. Or they cried, but you didn't pay attention. Or they're going to cry because something's going to happen. Hashem Yishmov Yatzil. Someone is going to cry. It's going to make them cry. It's always going to be something. So get ready. Every day there's something to fix. Every day. Your job, never perfect. Why? You're working. If it was perfect, we wouldn't need you. If the system was perfect, they wouldn't need you as an employee. The worst employee in the world is an employee that says, I don't know what to do. You're fired. That's what you should tell them. What you should do is leave. You don't know what to do? Leave. That's what you should do. We're going to find somebody who knows that something to do. Why? If you're working here, that means that something needs to be done. If you have nothing to do, it's not that there's nothing to do. It's that you don't care to the extent that you're looking for nothing to do unless somebody tells you something to do. You don't realize that the system is broken. You're not smart enough to be an employee. We need someone smart enough to be an employee. Someone that can figure out something to do. Why? Because there's always something to do. Always. If you don't have something to do, you shouldn't work here. We're going to find somebody that can find something to do. Oh, I was waiting for you to tell me. Oh, you're waiting for me to tell So you want to give me another job of thinking about stuff to tell you to do. It's not enough that I have 87 other jobs. I need another job for every employee. Thank you. I should, I should pay you for that. You're the boss. I should pay you for that, no? Or you should pay me for thinking about the, the, the idea. Why people want things to be perfect? It doesn't work that way. Your job is not really going to be perfect. You have to create it. You have to do something. Judaism is not perfect either. Why? You have to make it perfect. It doesn't come naturally to anyone to have 100% kavana in their prayer. The vast majority of us, when we pray, we forgot we've been talking to God. Well, come on, when was the last time? Be honest with yourself. Don't raise your hand though. It's going to be embarrassing. When was the last time you actually prayed and you actually thought you're, thinking, you're, you're talking to a God's Mohu? Bimit. Last time you actually prayed and actually thought about God from the beginning of the prayer all the way to the end. And you didn't think about baseball, basketball, football, uh, your stock market portfolio, your, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your dog, whether you took him out or he's peeing in the house, whether it's a, uh, whether you have to go to the bathroom now and your stomach's really hurting and you should really stop or you shouldn't stop and what are you going to have for dinner and what you had for lunch and where you're going to go and who's coming over and why is the bell ringing? And when was the last time you actually thought about God? When? We have so much junk in our head, we forget to think about God. And what do you think? It's only with praying. Sometimes you can have people learning to and forget that they're talking about God. They read it like it's a storybook. So how, what do we do? You have to stop. Like we talked about last week in the Yigiret Ramban Shiu, when it's time to pray, when it's time to learn, you have to make it work. Turn everything else off. Nothing matters. 
and start realizing that, okay, if you can't get rid of this thought of work, marriage, children, food, whatever it is, you can't get rid of it, right? So what do you do? Connect it to God. How can I connect this issue with God? Okay, the marriage is not working. So, okay, God, what should I do with my marriage? Okay, I, I, kids, the kids are jumping off the walls. What do I do, God? Well, it's mitzvah is to teach them Torah. So hopefully they'll jump a little less off the walls and more do Torah. Or even if they're jumping off the walls, as long as they're saying Mishnayot, it's okay anyway. Expect it. Food. How do I connect my food? Well, let's see. Where am I going to eat? Who has the best kashrut? Should I just cook at home? Should I start connecting all of these things that are in your mind to HaKadosh Baruch Because most of us can't get rid of the thoughts. So what do you do? Take the thoughts and connect them to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Which means that even to pray requires effort. To study Torah requires effort if you want it to work. Or else you're just going to be a robot. Or else we're all just robots. The mitzvot become robotic. You're putting the lulav, you forget you're even doing it because you're looking at everybody else's lulav and seeing who has a nicer talk than you. And you're like this all day in Sukkot. You forget you have, the, you have it in your hand. You're looking at everybody else. They stop shaking, but you're still shaking. Yom Kippur, everyone's praying. You're just waiting. When is the fast going to be over? Robotic. Robotic. Why? It was created that way. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created it in an imperfect way in order to make you a partner. If you want it to be a partner, you'll try harder. You'll try harder. You want to be an employee? You'll be a robot. Hashem doesn't want employees. Now, when it comes to all of the mitzvot, Rabotai, if we start picking up and working on ourselves and realizing that we need to make things perfect, suddenly the creation starts to make more sense. You're not going to ask foolish questions like, why did God do this and why did God do that? Obviously this is part of the whole system. Everything that happens, whether we understand it or not, is part of the system. Sometimes you're going to go see one of these videos of these factories that make ice cream and all types of foods and so on, and you don't really understand how this milk is going to end up into this ice cream and how they put the chocolate and then even after they show it to you they show you the whole system and all of a sudden it becomes this you know solid piece of ice cream and then they put the chocolate on it, but you still can't get how to get the stick in and then after you got the stick and they just went through a machine but you didn't really see what happened so it just goes into the machine and then it leaves the machine but when it went into the machine it didn't have a stick but now it has a stick it went into the machine, it had no chocolate, but now it has chocolate. You saw it go into the machine, but you don't understand how it did it inside. Guess what? You still eat ice cream. Why? It doesn't matter how it worked. You just know it worked. The point is, Rabotai, is that sometimes it's not for us to understand everything that Hashem does. We still have to do it. We still have to listen to what he says. We still have to accept everything that he does because we know it works. The system works. He's been doing it for a long time. He's much better at it than you. So the whole situation that's happening with Corona is forcing people to get closer to the understanding that we have right now. That Hashem is the one running the show. And that we have to make a better effort to serve Him and not ourselves. The people that serve, start serving Him will be saved, will be in a good situation. The people that don't and continue serving themselves will see their lives disappear in front of, their, in front of them. Just all their friends, all their family, all the people that matter to them will simply disintegrate. Why? Because that's part of life, with or without Corona. Corona is just expediting that understanding, giving more people a chance, because sometimes, unless you put a gun to somebody's head, he's not going to move. So Hashem is putting a gun to all of our heads. There's no community that's safe. 
There's no community that's safe. There's no town that's safe. There's no, even if you look at the map, if you look at the map of everybody that has corona, pretty much the only places that you have like really few cases is Russia and Africa. But even there you have very small numbers in comparison to the size of the land, but that could also be because of lack of reporting. You know, Russians, you know, they're not exactly friends with anyone right now. Earlier this week, they decided that uh, the oil deal that's been uh, keeping the oil market at bay is simply not worth it for them. So they went into a battle with the Saudi Arabians and uh, they went tit for tat with people's lives and pretty much the oil market dropped over 30% in value. Oil prices dropped 30% in value in a single instant. Only once in history has such a thing happened. And just so you know, this could very well lead to the Third World War. That's how impactful this is. This is not like, oh, it dropped $10. What's the big deal? No, no. This is a big deal. This is much worse than Corona. When it comes to money, when it comes to world power, much worse than Corona. Why? Because you're talking about trillions of dollars, not even billions. Talk about countries, talk about uh, all types of things. The impact of what happened earlier this week. Right after the shear we had, on the way home, somebody sent me a message, told me, look what happened. The OPEC deal dropped, oil is down over 30%. I said, we may be running out of time. Why? This is the type of stuff that starts wars. Now everyone's acting like, okay, they went down already, everything's going to be okay. No, no, not so fast. Why? It's all going to have an impact. Same thing with Corona. It's all going to have an impact. So, briefly before we go to your questions, for anyone that's still crazy enough to invest in the stock market or actually think that investing in anything right now should even matter to you, other than investing into helping people publicize Torah and do tshuva and learn Torah, this is, in essence, what's happening. Even if they find a cure or a vaccine, it's going to take a long time for it to hit the market. Which means that this corona epidemic or, 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 or pandemic is, is without a miracle, without a miracle, it's not going away. Get used to hearing the term. No, you shouldn't even bother watching the news every day. Why? Doesn't make a difference. Nothing you can do about it. Watching news is just going to stress you out. She's gonna stress you out. No, shouldn't I know for what? You should know what's gonna happen at the end of the uh, at the end of the world, or what's gonna happen at Olam Abba, uh, what's gonna happen if you don't do tshuva. You should know about that stuff. Knowing about Corona is not gonna help you. Don't watch the news. It's just gonna depress you, stress you, and it's definitely not gonna help you. You want to track things once a week just to see how bad things are. But Chavo, do it. If it takes two minutes, but to watch the news on a regular basis, complete waste of time. Complete waste of time is just going to ruin your life. You're going to be stressed out 24 hours a day. Before you know it, you're going to fill up your whole house with potato chips and uh, bottles of water. Because you're going to be thirsty after you ate all those potato chips. <laughs> you know, you know, it's not, it's not going to help you. What's going to help you? Fixing, fixing. Start fixing. Start perfecting your life. Perfect your marriage. Perfect your relationship. Perfect your bleat. Perfect your Shabbat. Perfect your Torah. Perfect your everything. That's what's going to help you. Whether the person's going to live or die, Kadosh Baruch going to decide with or without Corona. What do you think, just because a person doesn't get Corona, no one else dies? 55 million people die every single year, without Corona. You're talking about a quarter million people a day, die. Go to sleep, don't wake up. Without Corona. Corona's 5,000 people died. So, learning about Corona every day, what are you going to be, the uh, community's Corona expert? What's that going to do for you? Next, after people realize that no vaccine or cure is really going to help the economy, and like I said, absent of a miracle, it's not going away anytime soon. As the market realizes this, they're going to realize that this is going to have a major impact on the world in such capacity like we've never seen before. And the reason why is because right now, the most infected country is China, which is the leading economy in the world, not just because of money, 
not just because they're a twenty trillion dollar economy that you know surpasses the America a few years ago, but also because most of the other economies, mainly America, depend on Chinese economy, depend on the manu- manufacturing and all the supply and import, export, and so on. So it's not that they're just a, a producer of certain things, they're a receiver of certain things, and so on, which means that they they have their tentacles everywhere. So this is going to have a world impact. When the market realizes this, it's going to make the last couple of weeks of the market dropping 20% seem like a good day. And the reason why is because we have a very different market today than we had when I was still in it six, seven years ago. And much, much different than when I started in the business 20 years ago, a little more than that. The reason why is because today we have something called over liquidity. Now, over liquidity is when you have easy access to anything you want to buy in the press of a button. Now, theoretically, this was where the market wanted to be. 20 years ago, if you wanted to buy a mutual fund, you had to wait to know what price you paid for it. Let's say you wanted to buy a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, a thousand dollars worth of some mutual fund. You gave the broker the money. I want to buy X amount of this XYZ mutual fund. You didn't know what you paid for it until the market closed. If you want to sell it, even if you want to sell it at nine o'clock in the morning, you're not going to know what you sold it until the end of the day. Because that's how mutual funds work. And that's where the majority of the money invested in the stock stock market was. It was in mutual funds. Because the majority of the market is invested in funds. Via the retirement plans, IRA plans, 401k plans, 529 plans, and so on and so forth. People's retirement money goes into mutual funds. Now, this also helped the market somewhat be controlled to a certain extent from panics because you would never have massive selling at once because even if people wanted to sell because something happened they'd have to wait that is no longer the case today the leading item that people have their money invested in in their 401ks and other retirements and hedge funds and so on is something called exchange traded funds ETFs Now the difference between them is that these ETFs trade like regular stocks. Which means you can buy and sell it a million times in the same day. And it trades like a regular stock. Which means that if I want to buy a million dollars worth of this ETF, this fund, and sell it within two seconds of each other. I want to buy a million, sell a million. I can do it. And that's actually one of the major tools that people use for trading. The problem is that these ETFs actually own the stocks and the things that they have, the bonds, the stocks, and whatever they have, these, these underlying tools that are on it, that are in it, and at the end of the day, they settle up and decide how much more of each things they have to buy, how much more they have to sell, and so on. The problem is here that when you have massive selling and massive buying of anything, these ETFs work instantly, which means that you have right now almost six trillion dollars that has been transferred from mutual funds to these ETFs. Putting us in a situation where if there was panic selling, not only would people want to sell, but the ETFs would have to sell themselves, which would exasperate the damage because now you sold the ETF, they have to sell the underlying vehicle, whatever's in it. The bond, the stock. Now, if you're just buying and selling a few million dollars, no one really cares about you. Like people think if they have a million dollars in the market, they're rich. You're nothing. With all due respect to your million or ten million dollars, you're still zero according to the market terms. But when you have an entire pension plan, entire uh, retirement plan, uh, or just an enormous amount of people panicking, everybody starts selling. That means that the ETF has to start selling the vehicle itself, which makes the damage exaggerated, much more than what it is, because now there's, in essence, double. And you have yourself a situation where it could literally lead to the market dropping by 50% in a day, in a week. 
without them shutting the market down, there's no way to stop it. Because you don't have the benefits or the luxury of waiting for the end of the day and letting people calm down and letting things calm down and letting more news you know, go into the market. You don't have that luxury anymore. Everything is intraday, instant. So much so that when I first started in the business in 98, I think it was, there was almost 10,000 traders on a New York Stock Exchange floor. Today, there's more news reporters on the New York Stock Exchange floor than there are people that work there. It's a few hundred people work there. That's it. And they only work there because they're keeping them there. Why did everybody else go? Everybody else either replaced by computers or they work in offices. Because there's no need to be there anymore. Everything is electronic. Even the traders that used to make two, three, four, five million dollars replaced by computers. Everything is, everything is automated. Everything is based on algorithms, which means that the effect, the impact that you've seen in the last couple of weeks in the market, where the market dropped 20%, which is unprecedented, it's not normal for a market to drop 20% in such a short period of time, is actually nothing. That could happen in two minutes. What you saw in oil at the beginning of the week is what could happen to the entire market in one minute because of all the things that changed so when people start understanding the impact that you have on the economy now where with or without a cure you have the biggest economy in the world is simply absent you have all of the other countries that depend on this economy absent tourism is absent Import expert almost absent. Uh, a lot of things are starting to realize the, the magnitude of what's happening here. That means that this year, the economic difference, uh, the economic growth or decline that you're going to have from this year versus last year is going to be something like we've never seen before outside of depressions. Even what happened in the Great Recession of 2007 2008 is nothing in comparison to this because this is something that affects everything now the key is to understand if a person knows who's running the world knows that the only way they could lose or gain is based on the creator above knows that the only way they're gonna live or die is based on the creator above none of what I just said is going to make them panic but the less emunah and bitachon a person has the more they're going to end up panicking now I'm not saying that anyone should stay in the market and I'm not saying anyone should buy more or sell or anything I'm not giving anyone investment advice if I did I'd have to charge you for it but uh, the point is is that it's a market that if I was in a business this would be hell on earth because even if you know what's going on and you predicted everything that's going on it doesn't mean that the clients are going to agree with you to do what's necessary to do so the whole day you become a psychiatrist it's simply hell on earth but either way, Rabotai Karim, this is a Kadosh Baruch Hu waking us up and telling us that everything that we have built, everything that we have, everything that we planned has always been in His hand. He just wanted to make us feel like it was really in our hand to see maybe we're going to one day question it. Since we didn't question it enough, He's forcing us to question it. So the things that are happening right now in the world are going to make everyone question their own existence. Hopefully enough people realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to get our attention for a good reason before more damage happens. But so long as we do not do tshuva, reality is that things are going to get worse and worse because that's what happens. If the sickness does not react to the medicine, what do you have to do? Increase the medicine. 
If someone has a sickness and you treat them with the right medicine, but it's just not enough, you have to increase. You have an infection, they're going to give you 250 milligrams of amoxicillin three times a day. Not enough? Okay, we're going to move to four times a day. Not enough? We're going to increase to 500 milligrams. Three times a day, four times a day. Until, we get to, until you get this infection out. Why? If we don't, you're going to die. Yeah, but it's hurting the body too. It's hurting the body in order to save it. It's hurting creation in order to save it. Question is, how much medicine do we need? That's the question. So with that being said, now that you guys are all depressed, Bechavod asked some questions to cheer me up at least. At least one of us will be happy. Yeah, Sutton. Oh, he said to cheer you up. I don't know if it's a good question. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Give it, give him the... Uh... How could I learn to enjoy Judaism? How can you learn to enjoy Judaism? It's a good question. Now, someone asked me today if I, sh- if I can do a shiur about Gan Eden. And uh, at some point, we're thinking about doing a series. Uh, maybe after we finish the, uh, we complete the series about Igeret Ramban. We're contemplating a few series, but I think I, uh, maybe we'll do a series about the, the Rambans, Shara Gmul, which talks about Gan Eden and Genom. Um, because this is a very uh, critical um, foundation of Judaism. But uh, it cannot be a series just about Gan Eden. And the reason why is because most people won't understand Gan Eden. And I'll give you guys an example. The, and this will answer your question. The Ramban writes in Shara Gmul that there's Gan Eden and there's Genom. And that Gan Eden is having a clearer perception of the divine presence as if you're pointing with a finger at God from the midst of the chorus of the high perception and the unique delight of the bottle of bodily joy and this suggests that the people of the that will be at the uh, Olababa will attain the eminence of Moshe Rabenu whose soul was spiritually so far above his body that his bodily powers were voided and he was at all times arrayed with Ruach HaKodesh. I'll explain what all this means in a moment. It was as if his sight and hearing were only of the essence of the soul alone and were not accomplished through the medium of a physical eye. This was how the other prophets perceived the, uh, the, the powers of the body were voided by those of the soul being expanded so the Ruach HaKodesh emanated upon it. Okay. Now, most of what I just said is gibberish to most people. Reason why is because it is gibberish to most people. Because unless you understand what Gan Eden is supposed to be, you have no idea what I just said. Sounds cool. Because you heard a few familiar words like Moshe Rabbeinu. Soul, you know, finger, God. You heard a few familiar words. You think you understand what I just said? No. Do I understand what I just said? No. But I can explain to you what I said. Gan Eden does not offer the benefits that we view as benefits. Meaning the reward in Gan Eden is not the reward we would expect. And the reason why is because all of the things that we aspire to have and to feel are not necessarily good. We view things that are good that are usually dependent on physicality. So whether it be more food, more intimacy, more uh, feelings of that nature, more kavod, more power, more respect, honor those are the things we view as good so if 
we were to design our own Gan Eden like they do in the movies, we would design like a vacation resort. We are just sitting there on the beach, the water is clear that you could see the bottom of the ocean with all of the sharks and the dolphins over there, and you're sitting over there getting a suntan, and there's a bunch of beautiful people serving you as if you're the master. That's what Gan Eden is to the average person. That looks nothing like real Gan Eden. Nothing like. Why? Because all of those are physical pleasures, most of which are not good for you. Unless they're used in a certain way, in a perfect, in, 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 in a kosher way, so Gan Eden, if Hashem were to give us more details about it, we wouldn't want to go there because we won't view much of that as any good because we think that more people to be intimate with is good. Hashem says, no, no, that's good for genom. We think getting more honor is good. Hashem says, that's definitely very good for genom. We think that uh, eating more food and ge- is good. Oh, that's good for the chibut uh, kevel. Takes the, the, the worms, will eat more meat. Because you ate more meat, the worms will eat more meat. Meaning all the things that we get physical pleasure of, if we go out of, you know, it gets out of control too much, that helps the bad side, not the good side. The good side is having a clear understanding or clearer understanding of God. Now this would not sound very good to most people because we don't understand God to begin with. But what the Ramban does here in Shara Gmul is that he says the following. He says that when you understand God, you can feel like Moshe Rabbeinu felt while he was on earth, which is unbelievable, by the way. Anyone that actually paid attention to that part, it's truly unbelievable that we can only hope to get to a point after we leave this miserable body, after we leave it, our ultimate hope, I hope, I pray every day, that one day I'm going to go to Gan Eden. For what? To feel like Moshe Rabbeinu felt in this world. That's how holy Moshe Rabbeinu was. And what was this feeling? Clarity of what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is and what He wants. That gives a person a certain divine pleasure that the world can never, physicality, can never compete with. So since we do not understand anything that I just said, including what I just said now, this is something that you can understand. How could we want the things we don't understand? First, we do know what we don't want. We don't want to suffer. No one wants to suffer, even someone that's depressed. Hence the reason of why there are many more details of Genom than there are about Gan Eden. Because Genom is pure suffering. We do not want to go to Genom. So one motivation for a person to follow the law is in order to avoid genom, avoid suffering, suffering in genom, and also suffering in this world. Why suffering in this world? Because the more a person goes against God, the more God is going to have to keep giving him or her medicine. And medicine hurts. It's not always a pill. And even if it's a pill, it can have effects that you don't want. So first thing that will motivate us to do what God says is that we already know what we don't want. Second thing is that no one wants to be a average person. Everyone wants to be above average. No one wants to be an average employee. Everyone wants to be the best employee or even the CEO. No one wants to be a uh, average uh, sports uh, star. They always want to be the best. They compete. We're all competitive people. So, no. If anyone thought about it, how come you want to be the guy that has the nicest house, 
the nicest car, the most beautiful wife, the smartest, most beautiful kids, the most successful person, the, uh, the smartest person, everything in the physical world you want to be the best. But how come your Olam Abba is homeless? So when a person starts thinking about this, wait a minute, if I'm already going to go to Olam Abba, whether I like it or not, why don't I at least try to aspire to have the best one? Furthermore, the more you try to make your Olam Abba better, the more you start enjoying doing what you're doing. And that's part of nature that Hashem created. He created us in such a way that the more we do something, the more we like it. The more we put our effort into it, the more we like it. The reason why a child will never love the mother as much as the, as the mother loves the child is because the child put no effort whatsoever into raising the mother. When he came into this world, she was already here. On the other hand though, the mother invested everything. Her body, her mind, her, uh, our, our money, her time, her life, her marriage. Everything she invested for this kid. So naturally, because she invested so much in this kid, she loves him, even if he's rotten sometimes. The more you invest into the mitzvot, the more you invest into the Torah and make the Torah your baby, you make the mitzvot your baby, the more you will enjoy them. Because now you have a piece of yourself in this. What is this like? This is like somebody handing you something versus you building something. Imagine when you were a kid. You saw a tower in Lego town. And they made some fancy replica of the universe or something cool of dinosaurs from little pieces of Legos. You looked at it, appreciated it for maximum five minutes and left. But if you built it, you're never leaving that thing. Even if what you built is a microcosm of what they have in Lego Town. Yours is a little retarded dinosaur that has like three heads, but you, you don't really realize it. But it's your baby. You created it. took you three days to put this monster together, and you can't wait to show it to every one of your friends. Why? Because you put it together. Look, look at what I did. Look what I did. Look what I did. Why you built it? If you moved into a house... And the house is brand new. Within a few months, it's like any other house. But if you remodeled the house, and not only remodeled, you actually put some screws in the wall. You took some sheetrock and did, and did, you did all types of You actually did some work. This is your baby. This is your house. You're going to die in this house. Why? You built it. When you build something, it becomes yours. And you love it because you've invested into it. When it's just given to you, it's very little connection. This is the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu, when he gave Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah, he didn't give him everything, everything. What did he give him? He gave him the Ten Commandments. He gave him the written Torah until Parashat Itro, until the moment that they were at. He's not going to give him the entire five books of Moses because that would tell him the future. The rest of it he gave him at different times throughout the next 40 years. And he gave him the foundational laws of the oral Torah. Meaning, all of the principles of not only the basics of the law, but also how to arrive at the right law. He didn't give him all the discussions that Abaye and Rava are going to have. He didn't give him the discussions that Rabbi Shimon is going to have with Rabbi Yehuda and the debates. He gave him the foundational principles that Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon are going to use. That Rava and Abai are going to use. How to arrive at the law. Why didn't he just give him the law? Why didn't he just tell him, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no? That way we're not half retarded. We don't make any mistakes. Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu, like I just said, he wanted to make us partners in the Torah. 
If he just gave us yes or no, guess what? No one would study Torah. It would be boring. It would be like a test in high school. You just have to memorize stuff, even if you have no idea what the teacher is saying. The minute you finish the test, you care less about the subject. Why? It's all memory. But when you fought through different tractates and different chachamim and different opinions and all types of different times to get to the law, to fight for the law, to get to the eventual truth, now it's yours. Now you want to kill somebody over it. And that's why Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel, the, the, two, uh, the two sides, they got to fist fight sometimes. Arguing about the law. Not because they were Reshaim Chas V'Shalom, he's Tzadikim. Because they both arrived at a truth using the same rules, but they arrived at different truths. Same tools. But this tool built a house that say, you know, uh, has a side apartment, and this one built a house with a two-door front. Both are houses, but they look a little different. Both are true, but they look a little different. And they fought, no, mine's better, no, mine's better. I can rent mine, you can't rent yours. Yeah, but mine has better, more ceiling. Mine has a garage. Mine. They're fighting for the truth. They're fighting, but they're fighting because, to such an extent sometimes, and saying, listen, your truth is not just your truth. Your truth sometimes negates mine. Your truth is telling me that I'm living a lie. I'll kill you if you say I'm a lie. Why? Because my truth says that if I do it, I'm going to Gan Eden. But if I'm not doing it, I'm going to get home. So you're telling me that I'm not sure. You're telling me I'm going to get I'll kill you over that. And they would fight each other. But still at the end, arrive at the truth. And even if they still had a machloket, even if they still had a debate at the end, they'd still marry their kids together. Why? Because they loved each other. But they fought for the truth. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu got at Mount Sinai. So when you toil for Torah, you look at the page, you read it for six hours, and you don't have a clue of what you just read, that's a good sign. Why? Because that means that if you care about Torah, this is the test. Will you read it again? Or are you just going to say, ah, who cares anyway? If you say, who cares anyway, and you move on, you're never going to get the sweetness of Torah. Why? You want everything handed to you. You want everything handed to you. And this happens, unfortunately, a lot with people where they're stuck on just watching shiurim. They don't ever grow past the shiurim where... Although a person should always watch Shurim, even if he's a Talmit Chacham. Rav Ephraim watches Shurim. Rav Ephraim finished the Shas more times than uh, anyone else that I know. But he's still on his way to Kolel. And on the way back, any time that he's walking, he's out there, he listens to Shur. Funny, he listens to mine even though he doesn't speak a, a word of English. He says, I, I know a few words. Rav Ephraim this, Rav Ephraim this. You said my name a few times. He goes, but I know if the shoe was good based on your tone. He's the funniest, funniest person in the world. But the thing is, though, he listens to a few chachamim. If it's interesting, continues, doesn't, he goes on to the next one. But the point is that even though he studies all day, Baruch Hashem, he still listens to shurim. But it's not just shurim. If you're just going to be stuck on shurim, that's a problem. You're never really going to enjoy the Torah 100%, especially as a man I'm talking about. Why? Because everything is being handed to you. You come to the shoe, you ask a question, I'm giving it to you on a silver platter. You're not toiling for it, you're just watching it. Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> he's eating like a pig. <laughs> and he thinks that he's learning Torah. You're not, you're not going to enjoy it. Why? You stop listening to Shuin for two weeks, that's it, you become Chiloni. And that's what happens to people. <coughs> the people that just don't toil for Torah, what happens? As soon as they stop watching Shurim, two, three weeks, already they're down to a level of Shem Yishmol V'yatzil. Why? They never toiled for Torah, so they have no problem letting it go. But when you toil for Torah, you finish the tractate, blood, sweat, and tears. Hours and hours on every page. Hours and hours and pages on halachot. Uh, reading the whole thing, then realizing that you were wrong. Crying about it. Say, okay, I'll do it again. Reading the parasha with the commentary, another commentary. Doing all of this stuff and toiling over it, it becomes yours. So when one of your friends tells you to go out with some girl that you're not supposed to, or go to some place you're not supposed to, you're like, what, are you crazy? You know how hard I've been working? 
You know how hard I've been working to have what I have? What do you have? You have no house. You have no car. You have no money. Yeah, but I have Torah, you idiot. <laughs> he looks at you and he goes, I'm the idiot and you're saying you only have Torah, you have no more. How come? He says, because you think that the car, the house, and the money is something that means something. That only means something if you don't have Torah. When you have Torah, you know it means nothing. As long as you think it means something, then you're, you realize it's, it's, uh, you have no Torah. How do you enjoy the Torah? How do you enjoy the mitzvot? You have to invest in them. You have to work really, really hard. Which means that what Job said, Adam la'amal yulad is emet amita. Emet la'amita, meaning, Job says, a person came to this world to toil, to work hard. Anyone looking for an easy life is guaranteed only one thing, a hard life. Why? There is no such thing as easy life. An easy life only exists for someone that worked really hard. And that life of easy is not here. There is no easy life here. One that's looking for an easy life here will have a hard life that's miserable because he'll constantly be chasing his tail and never catching it. It's like looking for a corner in a circle. You can run as much as you want, and you can scream as much as you want, but you're never going to find a cer- you're never going to find a corner in the circle. That's a person that's looking for an easy life. Oh, relax and enjoy. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. Good luck with that one. Find me one person that has an easy life. It doesn't exist. With without money it doesn't make a difference. So how does a person start liking the mitzvot? Start liking the Torah? Start getting used to the mentality that I have to work hard in order for me to enjoy it. If I worked hard to build this Lego, I would appreciate this Lego a lot more. If I worked hard to build this car, I would appreciate this car, even if nobody else likes the car. Even if everybody else thinks this car is a piece of junk, I built the darn thing. To me, it's my baby. It's like a kidney. When my wife tells me to sell this car, I'm saying, honey, how about I sell your kidney? Tell me to sell the car. Why? Because you slaved over this stupid car that you feel like it's your baby. Needless to say with Torah, needless to say with mitzvot, when you work really hard to perfect the mitzvah, you fall in love with that mitzvah. And when someone ruins that mitzvah for you, Hashem Yishmo see what's going to happen to that person. Why? It's your baby. It's your everything. But that's the only way. Only way is hard. But the hard way is the easy way. The easy way doesn't exist. Next question. How about Moshe? Same price. So when you first do tshuva, you have this amazing feeling that comes to you. You feel great. You feel like uh, like you just were, I don't know, you, I don't know, the best. Cloud nine. Yeah. Right. So, over time, it goes away. Okay. Does that ever come back? So first, it's the first card to do on cloud nine. But then, cloud nine goes away and sometimes becomes a dark cloud. Does cloud nine ever come back? The answer is, depends on the person. The initial feeling that a baby gets when he or she first stands is unbelievable. They're so happy that they stood up that it's like the greatest thing in the world. They're, you look at their smile and you say, wow, I want to be that happy, like this baby. This, this, this year old baby is so happy that he stood up. Even though he's going to fall on his tushy two seconds later. For those two seconds, he's the happiest baby on planet Earth. But then, after a while, he's not so happy about standing anymore. Why? He wants more. He wants more than standing. He wants to start walking. So he takes a few steps and he falls. 
he gets a little upset, so he gets up again, and he falls, and he gets up again, and he falls, and it's not enough for him, he's not as happy, you see him start walking, taking a step, he's not as happy, when does he start getting happy? I have to start taking three, four, five steps, <laughs> like he's the happiest thing in the world, well, I took four steps, like he just, he just discovered America. But guess what? After a little while, four steps is not enough. Why? He wants to run like his brother and sister. Why? It's not enough to just take three, four steps. Yeah, but you were feeling good yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Yesterday's a long time ago. Like my kids tell me. You know, remember, Abba, a long time ago yesterday? Remember when, when we, we were dancing in your office a long time ago yesterday? To a kid a long time ago is yesterday. Then he starts running, and he runs, and he feels good about it. But then eventually, that's not enough. He wants something more. That's a Baal Tshuva. A Baal Tshuva that's going to continue to aspire for more will get back that feeling and more than what he had originally. But a Baal Tshuva that sparks, discovers the Torah, discovers Shabbat, starts keeping Shabbat, but you know, it's not really. Why? Well, here's another old alachot. Here's no, you're not allowed to drive because the rabbi says you're going to die. <laughs> he knows you're not allowed to use your phone because the rabbi says you're going to die. He knows you're not allowed to uh, touch different things so because the rabbi says you're probably going to die. The rabbi keeps saying you keep dying so he doesn't move the whole Shabbat, he sleeps. Guess what? After six months of this, he hates Shabbat. Why? He doesn't know why he's keeping it. He puts on tefillin. Why? Because the rabbi says if you don't have it, you're going to die. So he puts on tefillin, do, 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 he puts tefillin, 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 tefillin. After six months of this, he can't stand going to shul. Why? Why am I putting this rubber stuff on me, this leather, this stuff? Uh, is it real? Is it, what's in it? Why does Hashem care about this stuff? Why is it square? Why can't I make it like, you know, triangle? Make it like a Magen David. Maybe I should style it, put it, some stickers on it, tattoo it on my hand, engrave it, do something cool. Put some rims on it or something, at least, Rabbi. No, come on. Let me do something with this. Make it stylish. No, ah, it's boring. Boring. 3,300 years. The same piece of leather. Square. Black. Ah, it's like depressing, Rabbi. What? He doesn't know anything about this mitzvah. How is he going to enjoy it? He's parked at standing. After a while, standing is not enough. Why? The neshama wants more. The neshama wants more. The neshama is telling you, why do you lay tefillin? Why? Why is it square? Why is it black? Why don't you ever see somebody with pink and rims on a trillion? Why? Why do we do it? What does the Torah say about it? How come the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah says there are certain people that sin and they get punished for a year, but there are certain people that sin with their body and their punishment is eternally, even after Mashiach. And it says, what kind of example? It says, example is somebody that doesn't put on trillion. He goes to gain on forever. Why is it such a big deal? It's just some leather straps. What's a big deal? Why is it such a big deal? He doesn't know. He never discovered. He never looked into it. He doesn't actually care. And that's the problem. So long as he doesn't care, he's never going to enjoy the mitzvah. He's never going to get that original feeling that he had in the beginning when he did care. He did care in the beginning about who Moshe Rabbeinu was. He did care in the beginning about Shabbat. She did care in the beginning about modesty. She did care in the beginning about who a rabbi is. She did care about in the beginning about what kind of kosher food she's going to eat. He did care in the beginning about all types of things. But then he stopped caring. So that feeling went away with the careness. If he cares less, the feeling goes away. And he's like a little baby that's standing, but is seven years old. It's not so much fun if you're seven years old to just stand. You want to run. You want to climb. You want to do stuff. So you want that feeling? You have to work hard. You have to get your neshama to keep going, keep caring. This is also why Rabotai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in the holiest place on earth, the Bet Mikdash. Inside the Bet HaMikdash, even inside the Bet HaMikdash, there was a holiest point on earth inside it. It was called Kodesh Kodeshim. And inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, there was the holiest item in the world, in the universe. 
was the Aron HaKodesh. Why? Inside it were the Ten Commandments, both the set that's broken and the other second set, was a staff, staff of Moshe Rabbeinu, staff of Aron HaKohen. You had the man in a jar. You had the original Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote. All types of amazing things. Now all of these holy things, on top of it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu would speak to the Kohen, would speak to Moshe Rabbeinu, on top of it, with an area that's a tefach. A voice would come out of it. From where? From the space between two angels. The Cherubim. There were two angels in gold, engraved there, that were looking at each other. Two cute little angels with the image of babies. Now, if I was going to make Aaron Kodesh, I'd make him like a X-Men. I make the, the the angels look like X-Men, like a Hulk, Diesel, jacked, got you know biceps from here to next town. Maybe has a sword or something, or a jackhammer. You mess with me, I'm an angel, right? That's why I don't make anything. <laughs> I make jokes of myself. That's what I make. But Akadosh Baruch Hu made babies. Why did he make babies? On the most holy place in the world, inside the holiest place in the world, inside the holiest, holiest place in the world, Kodesh Kodesh Shim, inside the Aron HaKodesh, on top of it. Where Akadosh Baruch Hu's voice comes out, it's two little babies. Why two little babies? Why two little babies? He wanted to tell us that the holiest thing on earth is coming from this imagery. Why? What's coming from two babies? What, to have babies is the most holy thing in the world? What if the baby is Hitler? That's still holy? No, obviously it's not that. He says, look at these babies. Look at these babies. What do you think of when you think of a baby other than cute? You think of the baby's personality. A baby's personality is that he always wants more. He wants to learn more. He wants to do more. He's interested in everything. Everything goes in his mouth. Everything he wants to look at. Everything he wants to do by himself. He says, that's what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to want more. More of Hashem's Torah. More of Hashem's mitzvot. More understanding of the divine presence. More. That's what we have ambition for. A Baal Tshuva is like a baby. A convert is like a baby. They want everything. If you stay with that mentality, you'll get really far. You'll get to the holiest place on earth, holiest place in the universe. If you stay with that mentality and you exercise that mentality of wanting more, more mitzvot, more Torah, more knowledge, more clarity, you'll arrive at the greatest point that anyone else can. But if you stop acting like a baby and you don't want more anymore because you're happy with what you have, you start acting like a retiree. You just want to sit there and do nothing until you die. Then you start suffering. Then everything becomes like a burden. Then putting on tefillin is like you're putting on chains. Keeping Shabbat is like almost like they're sending you to a guest chamber. Eating kosher, it's almost like, ugh, you don't want to eat it. Why? I don't know why. It's just not good to me. Being married all of a sudden seems miserable. Having kids, you start thinking about the money it's going to cost you. All mitzvot become like a burden. It's like one sack of potatoes. Why? You don't want to put in anything into it. You don't want it. When you don't want something, automatically it becomes bad. When you don't want to be married, automatically your spouse becomes ugly. When you don't want kids, automatically you don't like anyone else's kids either. When you don't like your job, guess what? Automatically, you start seeing everything that's wrong with this company. How come it didn't matter to you for the first five years you worked for them? How come all of a sudden everything is wrong with this company? How come you didn't say nothing for the first five years? You don't want to work for somebody, automatically the boss is rotten. How come you didn't say he's rotten for the first five years? You don't want to do mitzvot. All of a sudden, all the rabbis are terrible. All of a sudden, you're having questions about God. 
Who made God? How come he didn't ask this the first five years? How come? Because it's not the question. You don't want to be religious. You want to be the Shah. Enjoy yourself and gain them. If you're going to do that. But once you start realizing my lack of enjoyment is only because of my lack of effort. When I put effort into it, I liked it. You have to find a way to push yourself to start investing more. You invest more into doing it, you're going to start liking it. All of the mitzvot. Learning, writing, listening, doing. You'll become the most excited person in the world. Excitement doesn't mean you become one of these firecracker personalities, start jumping around in the bikini. Hey guys, how are you at 6 o'clock in the morning? No, it's not that. Excited meaning that you're actually passionate about the mitzvot. Don't be one of those 6 o'clock in the morning guys excited. No one, no one wants to talk to you. Be excited inside, quietly. Excited inside. But point is, you'll be excited. Do mitzvot. When someone says, oh, it's three-day Yom Tov. You're like, wow, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem, three-day Yom Tov. Not like one of these people say, why, wow, it's three days this year, Rabbi? What if I go to Israel? You're looking for less Yom Tov? The whole year we're waiting for Yom Tov. The whole year we're waiting for Yom Tov. You're looking for less Yom Tov? That's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. If you're looking for a shorter Yom Tov, if you're looking for the fast to end, if you're looking for the holidays not to come or to be over, it's a very bad sign for your neshama. It means that the entire Torah is a burden. Now, just to scare you guys, because I like to scare you, because it's good for you, and it's also good for me to remind me, there's two types of genom. Genom. Fire, genom of ice. Chazal asked, what's the difference? What's the difference? It says the fire goes to a person, who, who goes to the fire, who goes to the ice? I'm not talking about Shabbat, they turn off the fire, send the guy to the ice. Not talking about that. I'm talking about, no, no, there's certain people, they go to the genom, it's ice, there's certain people go to genom, it's fire. Why? It says the one that touched the things that he's forbidden, he touched the girl that he was forbidden. She touched the guy that she's forbidden. They touched the food that is forbidden. Fire. That's what they get. You did stuff that's forbidden. Fire. Okay, fine. I get that. You could rationalize this easily. What's the ice though? Why? I didn't touch it? That's what means why then. He goes, no. Ice goes to the heart of people. They didn't want to do the mitzvot. They didn't do what they were supposed to. He didn't put on tefillin. Why? Eh, I don't feel like it, Rabbi. He didn't learn Torah. Eh, why not? How come he didn't come to the shul? I was tired. You, didn't, you weren't tired to play on the internet until 3 o'clock in the morning. He didn't feel like learning Torah. He was tired. He didn't feel like putting on tefillin. He was tired. He didn't feel like eating kosher. He was tired. He didn't feel like getting married. He was tired. Hashem says, no problem. You'll wake up in Gainom, the cold one. Why? Your heart was cold to my mitzvot. I'll put you in a special place. Mida keneged mida. Cold against the mitzvot goes to a cold place. Hashem yishmo be'atzil. Even the places have their reasons. Even the places have their reasons. Next question. This parasha, the uh, it says that uh, um, Hashem shows uh, Moshe the the knot in his tefillin. What it like? What it, you know? What does that mean? How how do we understand something like that? Bara talks about it in Masech Brachot. That uh, as a midrash that says that uh, when uh, Hashem uh, told uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, no one can see my face and uh, and live, and therefore uh, I could only see you my back. So the pshat is that 
Hashem cannot show anybody the future, meaning what He's doing right now, the present or the future, and you understand it while you're still in this world. If He showed you the future of how the world ends, you won't understand why it ended that way. Even if He showed you the present and what He's doing right now, you wouldn't understand why He's doing what He's doing. Because you're still in this world, you're still limited. But He says, I can show you my back, because that will show you things after I've already completed them. Meaning you'll see all three points. The, uh, the past, present, and future of that particular issue. And you'll understand why I did what I did. So that's the pshat of Hashem saying to Moshe Rabbeinu that I can't show you my face and you live. I can only show you my back. But then the Midrash gives a curveball. Where it says, yeah, but when he passed him, there was actually something passing. And, and Moshe Rabbeinu saw the back of his tefillin. Answer to that is, we have no idea. That's the answer. The answer is, we have no idea. Because God, this, on one end, contradicts the 13 principles of faith. That God does not have a body or the likeness of a body. Hence the reason where it says that He does not have a head. So what does it mean? Have tefillin. But then on the other end, the Torah says that Hashem fulfills the entire Torah, including putting on tefillin. What does that mean? I have no idea. I asked my rabbi the same question. And he gave me a similar answer to what I'm telling you right now. Um, but there's also another Gemara that if you read, I believe it's Masechet Brachot. Uh, where it talks about how the Kohen Gadol was so holy that the angel of God came to him and said, bless me. As the person, a human body, flesh and blood... Asked him, Hashem asked him, or the angel of God asked him, give me a blessing. And he gave him a blessing, may your will be, uh, may uh, your kindness overcome the, the, the anger, I think it was, or something, of, may your will be fulfilled. I, I don't remember exactly the blessing, but it says that he nodded his head three times. What head? So some say, yeah, this was an actual angel representing Hashem, not really Hashem. This could be the same thing in this particular story, but 100%, I can't tell you an answer. I could tell you it was an angel of God, because there are angels of God that are called that same name. There's cer certain angels that represent God, certain angel that represents God, that he's called the same name, but it's not God. So I could tell you that answer, but I cannot tell you with a real heart, an honest heart, that that's 100% the answer. Same thing that you could say in the different parts of the Torah, where it says that Am Yisrael saw a special stone under Hashem's feet. Now you can use all types of examples and learn all types of metaphors from it and explanations of what it really was and what it really wasn't, but there's still a shot there that there was feet and that there was something. What does that mean? A hundred percent answer? We're only going to find when Mashiach comes. But different answers, there's books, books, entire libraries written about this question that you have. Different Chachamim discussing the different uh, aspects of it. What could it be? What's this? What's that? Who said this? Who said that? But uh, obviously I don't know all the answers. I can just tell you that these are just a couple of the answers. But bottom, bottom line, 100%, we're going to find out when Mashiach comes. Next question. If nobody else has a question, you can ask another question. No, somebody didn't ask a question. Anybody from the back or are you guys on strike? Okay, they're on strike. Fine. Go ahead, ask another question. Also in this power chapter 34, 6 through 7, they talk about uh, Hashem's 13 attributes of mercy. What's the significance of reciting this with Kavanah when you're praying this in a Minyan? Did you read the commentary? Yeah. Then you have the answer. Uh, Some of the attributes of, of mercy is a uh, gift, is a special gift that uh, Malach HaMavet gave to Moshe Rabbeinu. There's a certain blessing that Malach HaMavet gave, gave to Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and he said that anytime there's a decree on Am Yisrael, say this, and it will ease the decree. It's like a cure. Each of the angels gave Moshe Rabbeinu a present. Malach HaMavet gave him this. He's in essence the one that's uh, give, given the right to take life 
of certain people. So he knows what also gives, uh, in essence, gives a person more time or cure. So he gave this gift to Moshe Rabbeinu. This was the gift that the Malach HaMavid gave to Moshe Rabbeinu. So when we say it, we are honoring God we're give, by using all types of adjectives and by using his own words in order to describe him, showing that we are his children. When someone asks you about your parents, how do you know that's your mom? How do you know that's your dad? You know, prove it to me. Say, well, we have the DNA. No, no, no DNA. Prove it to me that's your mom and dad. We look alike. Oh, you can look like a lot of other people. Prove it to me. You're going to start describing the person. Oh, I know that she does this and she does that and she likes this and she likes that. He likes this and he likes that. You start describing them. Ah, once you give a lot of details of who this person is that only a child would know, say, ah, yeah, that's right. She's your mom. She, he's your dad. When we give these details of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we're showing that we're his children. Because we're the only nation that describes him this way. No other nation describes God this way. Next question. Wait, uh, no, I, I don't need the mic. The, mic. Well, I, the, the people on the mic and the camera need the mic. Okay. Mic's not for you, it's for me. No? Question is, uh, do you said the Mashiach would be any righteous person out of Israel or any Jew out of anywhere in the world? Well, it doesn't, the, as far it as doesn't Mashiach, specify. Right, as far as, far as Mashiach <laughs> is concerned, the only thing that's specific is that this person obviously has to be a Shomer Torah and Mitzvot. He has to be a Jew, a natural born Jew. He cannot be a convert because he has to be of a descendant of David Melech. Uh, so he has to be a direct descendant of David Melech. Uh, where he lives, uh, that I don't believe is uh, said anywhere. He could be living in uh, Ghana, he could be living in Israel, he could be living anywhere. Uh, I could tell you that there is quite a few people that think they're Mashiach. Uh, some are Jews, some are non-Jews, some are male, some are female. Uh, all of them are wicked. Because anyone that tells you he is Mashiach, for sure is wicked. Because that makes a Navi Shekel. A Mashiach is a Navi. A Mashiach is a prophet. And anyone that says he's a prophet and he's not a prophet, that's a death penalty. You don't give death penalty to, uh, to good people. Death penalty is to Rishayim. So anyone that says he's Mashiach is by default wicked. Unless he's really the Mashiach. And if he's really the Mashiach, he's not going to have to say he's Mashiach. Why? We're going to know. It doesn't say in the Torah, the Mashiach is going to say, I'm the Mashiach, please pick me. Or like this crazy guy from India says, why don't you guys call me and come pick me up? I'm Mashiach. This crazy Indian guy. He's not even Jewish. He says, when are you guys going to come pick me up? I'm Mashiach. I'm the chosen one. It's the craziest thing in the world. He doesn't even know how to speak Hebrew, but he decided he's Mashiach, but he needs to be picked up. All types of crazy people in the world. Mashiach will not have to declare he's Mashiach. You will know. Why? God said so. God said so. He's going to be able to smell. Smell your sins. I don't even know what that means. I can see your sins. Shem seen When you're playing with your phone during a lecture. When you're talking to each other instead of listening to me. I can see him. But he's going to be able to smell him. Meaning, even if you look like Tzadikim like most of you look right now after I said it. He's going to be able to stick what's in your mind. All the things you did before the shiur, all the things you planned after the shiur. A Mashiach. Mashiach. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, Mashiach. Mashiach is not going to know he's Mashiach until he's Mashiach. Now, what about, you can ask the follow-up question, what about all the articles that are written in the news about there are some Chachamim that say that uh, are talking to the Mashiach on a regular basis. Rav Kanievsky talks to the Mashiach every day. Did he say it? The news said it, I said. I didn't say he said it. The news says that Rav Kanievsky says that he's speaking to the Mashiach every day. And that other Chachamim, like Rabbi Cook, Rav Cook, go visit him in Tveria. They go visit the Mashiach in Tveria on a regular basis. Those articles 
only one thing can tell you what you should do with them. Delete. There's an X button on your thing, press it. If it's a PC, it's on the right side. If it's, a, if it's an Apple, I think it's on the left side. It's like a green button or something like that, or red. Okay? Whatever it is, delete, escape, run away, shh, to yot. I ask this, I ask this, I ask all these questions because people ask me, so I have to ask. I ask my Rav, what about these articles? He goes, I know all these articles are fake. So says, why? He says, because they said that Rav Kanievsky speaks for the Mashiach. On a regular basis. I said, no, what, why is that a problem? He goes, Rav Kanievsky doesn't speak. <laughs> Even when people come to him for a blessing, he says, Bua, Bua. What's Bua, Bua? Bracha v'atzlacha. It's an acronym for blessing and success. Meaning, he limits his own words so much that he uses an acronym instead of two words. Why? It'll save a microsecond. So you're saying he's speaking to the Mashiach every day? What do you think? They're not going to talk shtiyot at some point if they speak so much? People are just living a fantasy in their mind, thinking they want Mashiach to come. Because they assume that they're righteous. They assume that the Mashiach is going to be the one that saves them. They're in the first row. They're in the first row of being saved. I don't know, all the righteous people that I know, not a single one of them is secure. All the righteous people that I know, I ask them about Mashiach, they start getting scared. You know who's not scared of Mashiach? Wicked people. That think they're righteous. Oh, I can't wait for Mashiach to come. Why? Why you can't wait for Mashiach to come? Why? He's going to solve all the problems. What do you think? Social security? He's welfare? What do you mean solve all the problems? What about the million kids in Israel that don't know how to say Kriyat Shema? What is he going to do with them? There's a million kids in Israel right now don't know how to say Shema Yisrael. You want the Mashiach to come? What do you think is going to happen to them? Do they go to Gan Eden? 80% of Am Yisrael doesn't keep Shabbat. 80% of Am Yisrael doesn't keep Shabbat. What do you think is going to happen to them? They're going to go to Gan Eden? Well, isn't he going to let them do Tshuva? No! That's the point. It ends. There's no more Tshuva. Mashiach now alik. People have to understand this Mashiach subject is not a joke. The real people that spoke about Mashiach didn't speak like the idiots of today. No one said Mashiach now. No one. Other than delirious people that don't understand what it means. Mashiach comes, Rabbi Karim, that's it, clocks out. You got a million kids in Eretz Yisrael. A million kids don't know Kriyat Shema. You got 80% of Am Yisrael does not know how to keep Shabbat. We want more time. That's what we want. More time to do tshuva, or people do tshuva. Whatever, whatever, whatever Hashem allows to happen. If people do tshuva tomorrow, let Mashiach come tomorrow. But the delirious people that write these articles just to get clicks just to get people to read their stuff and, 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 and get paid for it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an evil thing to do. Because it leads people astray, it eventually breaks people's hope. It's not a good thing to do. How do you know if Mashiach is here? Trust me, you'll know. The whole world's going to know. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, it'll be bigger than Mount Sinai. The whole world knew about Mount Sinai. The whole world saw the ocean split because the water split not only in the Sea of Reeds. The water split all over the world. If you had a coffee, your coffee split to 12. You had a little lake, your lake split. You had a little pool in your backyard, split. God's voice, everyone heard. No one questioned Mount Sinai until this awful generation. No one questioned it, Rabotai. Why? The whole world knew. Knew Mount Sinai. Mashiach will be bigger than Mount Sinai. And you're asking, oh, how do we know? You'll know. You'll know, you'll know. Ooh, you're going to know. You're going to know. You're going to know real well. By the time he comes, there's not going to be any doubts. 
So stop wasting your time reading these articles or watching lectures that specifically talk about the timing of Mashiach. Oh, Mashiach is going to come in Pesach 2020. Mashiach doesn't use the Christian calendar. A lot of Christian missionaries write these articles. I know they do. And so do Jews, though. They like to get views on the internet. Christians have their own problem. It's called Avodah Zarah. Let me fix all the Jews and then Bezot Hashem, I'll deal with the Christians. The point is, Rabotai, all of these people that write about Mashiach, that their whole life is focused about Mashiach, run away. Run away from those people. Run away from people that their whole life is just focused on Mashiach. That's not Judaism. Mashiach is a part of Judaism. Judaism is learn and do every day. Adam la'amal yulad. A person came to this world to toil over Torah. That's Mashiach. Daily. Daily. Every day you open a Sefer Torah, you see secrets of the creation to solve your life. That's what you're supposed to be. A Jew is not supposed to just constantly, you know, look for dates and different uh, Torah codes that talk about dates of when Mashiach is going to come. Oh, it's going to be two months. Oh, it's going to be three months. Oh, there's a big star. Oh, there's a small star. Oh, this guy, uh, I don't know what he's doing, but he said something. Enough, enough. That's not Judaism. Judaism is learning and toiling over Torah and overcoming the obstacles of day-to-day -day life. Mashiach comes, I promise you, you'll know it. I promise you, you'll know it. Next question. I'm almost done. This religious guy told me that the Lubavitcher Rebbe said that the Mashiach is going to be in Miami. If that's true, how would he know that? He just took two bites. I'm not even going to answer it. He's going to be in South Beach. I can't. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I, 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 don't, I don't even know what to do with this question. Listen, the Babit Sherebi was a Sadiq. Actually, my Chidushim that I have today is from him, but it has nothing to do with Mashiach. It has to do with what, what you need to do in order to be saved from Mashiach. That was the Chidushim that I have from the Lubavitch Rebbe. But it has nothing to do with Mashiach. <coughs> now since you mentioned the Lubavitch Rebbe, and people distort what he says all the time, so it's time we defended his honor and his Torah. Lots of people that mention the Lubavitch Rebbe's name distort the things he said make him look like a Care Bear Rabbi. Hashem Yishmo V'yatzil. Truth is, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was a tzaddik, Talmid Chacham, knew a lot of things about both the spiritual world and the material world. He was an engineer by trade. But he also built the Hasidut of Chabad to a point that it's beyond what it was before. And people think that that was over, you know, based on some uh, lovey-dovey type of Judaism that's different than ours. No, we don't teach Musar and Chabad. <laughs> <coughs> Who said that? Who said that? Wait, you think Hasidut is not Musar? That means you don't know Hasidut either. Hasidut is just another name for Musar. Hasidut is more. You look at the laws of the Hasidim, the more stringent than the rest of the Orthodox Jews. I'm not talking about the laws, just Allah of how to keep Pesach, not kids. I'm talking about behave. But people say things in the name of the Lubavitch Rebbe, the complete nonsense. Like, no, the Lubavitch Rebbe just taught to love and everything about love and love and love. I have a video from the Lubavitch Rebbe that we publicized some time ago. The Lubavitch Rebbe himself says, the only way to do Kiruv is by telling people the truth and not lowering the Torah to them by bringing them up to the Torah, even if the truth hurts. The opposite of Chabad today, today. The opposite of many Chabadniks today. Opposite. 
You think that the Lubavitch Rebbe got such siyat nishmaya for doing the opposite of what Hashem said? Now you say, wait, some of the things you say about modesty are stringent and strala. You know what the Lubavitch Rebbe said? I'm going to tell you what he said. I'm going to tell you what he said, and it's going to sound like I'm a puppy. Next to the Lubavitch Rebbe. Zecher Tzadik Libracha. In his Sicha. In his Sicha and Simcha Torah 5730. The Lubavitch Rebbe said the following. You must explain to the girls that the look of immodesty shows that the girl thinks that she will not be accepted by in any other way by the man. Not with her intelligence, because she doesn't have any. Not with her heart, because this too she doesn't have. And not with anything good, because she doesn't even have a decent, she's not even a decent human being. And the only way is if she shows the places of her body that are supposed to be covered, which only exposes her insignificance. As if she's holding a sign saying, intelligence I don't have, feelings I don't have, knowledge and positive traits I don't have, and even my face is ugly. And the only thing that I can offer is exposing the places that are supposed to be covered. And this will make me look better and will convince the man to speak to her and say hello to her. And this is the lowest level a person can embarrass themselves with, where the only thing that the man can see in her is the pritzut, is the immodesty, and nothing else. Show me one Chabadnik other than Arav Chaim Shlomo Diskin, Shichye in Eretz Yisrael, that said what I just wrote to you in a lecture seven years ago, six years ago. Show me another Chabadnik saying this. Quoting this, this, this Sicha. They quote a lot of Sichot. Quote this Sicha. No? Okay, I'll give you another one. In the Sefer called Atzne Alechet, which is different uh, compilation of letters from the Lubavitch Cherebi that talks about Sniut. He says, you must explain to the Talmidah, to the female student, that immodest behavior is not one that belongs to Benot Israel, to the, to the women of Israel, who are modest and will end up bringing her to different tests. Meaning a girl that acts immodestly will eventually have different tests where men will try to get her in different ways until it gets to the point of danger. And for anyone who doesn't understand what I just said, he elaborates. As the Rishonim, as the Rishonim said, break-ins happens to the thief. Thief breaks into other people's houses, his house also gets broken into. Why? It's measure for measure. And all of this begins with the lack of attention to small details of modest behavior. The Pirza Korah the Ganav. There's a principle in the Torah that a measure for measure and the measure for measure for a thief, he steals, Hashem sends people to steal from him. A woman that walks around immodest, she shows things that are supposed to be covered, then the people that are not supposed to be what's covered will see it. Amevin Yavin. Furthermore, the Lubavitch Rebbe says in the same Sefer Atzne Alechet, 600 page book, 13 chapters. He says, when a woman acts immodestly, such as having immodest clothing that grabs the attention, sometimes it's only in the way she walks, she ends up enticing. Anyone who sees her, who's then led to different foreign thoughts of immorality, and who knows where they, that can lead to. The sin is hanging on her, even if she didn't mean to do it, and doesn't even know about it. 
And therefore she's considered a machtia rabim, which means that causes the public to sin, which the Torah says does not get divine assistance to do tshuva, because the many who sinned because of her do not do tshuva. <coughs> so the Lubavitch Rebbe is talking to us, telling us, first and foremost, if you're walking around immodestly, young girl, old woman, oh, make a difference. There's no age. He says, all you're doing is you're showing that you mean nothing. You're a piece of meat. You have no brain. You have no feelings. You have no nothing. You have no value whatsoever other than uncovering what's supposed to be private. If he said it in a shul today, kick him out. Instead of screaming Mashiach, they'd kick him out if he said this. Then he says, by the way, that girl that got raped, the girl that guys took advantage of, put the club drink in there, made her fall asleep until the next day when it was too late. She did it to herself. Lubavitch the Rebbe is saying this. Now you're going. I'm just repeating it. You have to sue him. <laughs> he says that the Pritza Korala Ganav, she walks around immodestly. There's going to be guys that chase her in different ways until it gets dangerous. Don't misunderstand what that means. Rav Chaim Shlomo Diskin says, he says, he witness in his own eyes. One of the people from his, uh, from his uh, uh, seminar, a young girl, naive, religious girl, decided to start going out with some guy. And he said, why don't you come with me to Eilat? And this foolish girl went. And they had a good time. She came home a short while later and says, why don't we go again? Foolish girl made the same mistake twice. She went, but as soon as she arrived, she saw in the car, she saw his three of his friends. Who, who, who are these? Oh no, you don't mind if they come with us, right? It's my friends, my buddies. So, oh, okay. It's too late. You're in the car. You don't know what to do. Okay, fine. Oh, you know, what do I care? He's here. Right? So when she came back home from that weekend, she was suicidal. She was suicidal. She was suicidal. She was suicidal because of what happened to her on that weekend. The Bhavit Rebbe says she did it to herself. As much as we hate it, it's true. True. Now all these political correct lefty liberal anti Torah mentalities will probably want to rip my head off. But no no no, it's not my head. Go to the Bhavit Rebbe, Mashiach now. Why he said it. He said it. You know why he said it? Because Torah says it. You walk around him out of sleep, bad things are going to happen. Not just an Olam Abba and the genome that they're going to put you in to cook you. Not just that. He says in this world. In this world. You can't find a Shiduch. That's measure for measure. You're breaking marriages because of immodesty. Hashem's not going to give you a marriage. And furthermore, even if you want to do tshuva, it's going to be hard in the beginning. Why? Hashem's not going to help you in the beginning. Why? So many victims. So many victims looked at you and did all types of things. Foreign thoughts, he calls it. To him, it's a foreign thought, a shemi shmo. Today, it's not foreign. Where does he get it from? One of the sources is the Prophet Micha. Prophet Micha says, O oh man, what is good? Meaning, God's definition of good is different than yours. What does Hashem require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk modestly with your God? Micha says to us, what does Hashem really want from you? What's, what are you making such a big deal? Oh, I can't keep mitzvot, I can't keep... Why? What's so hard? Why? What, is he, what does really Hashem want from you, really? What does He want? He wants you to keep the Torah. 
What? It's hard for you to do the tilat yadayim in the morning. Hard for you to do a blessing before you eat. Bekat the mazon. Hard for you. Put on filin six days a week. Hard for you. Keep Shabbat. You're sleeping and eating for 25 hours straight. It's hard for you. What's so hard? What? What's so hard? What's the big deal? You don't eat bread for a week. Wow. You shouldn't eat bread the whole year, by the minute, with your weight. You should be fasting 360 days a year with your weight. He only makes you fast five times a year. What's a big deal? You're making it such a big deal to keep Torah. It's like uh, you Moshe Rabbeinu lifting the mountain. What's the big deal? What does he want from you? He says, he wants you to do justice, meaning keep the Torah. He wants you to love chesed. What's chesed? Kindness. What? Care about each other. Stop talking bad about each other. Stop judging each other for no reason. Stop stealing in your business. Help each other get closer to Hashem. What does, he, what, what does he want from you? These two things are simple, right? But then he adds one more. He says, walk modestly. Walk modestly with Hashem. Be a modest human being. Cover your body. Cover your mouth too. All the filth that comes out of people's mouth. That's it. That's what Hashem wants. You want Ganeda? That's it. Finished. That's what he wants. And Rashi says, Micha is telling us something clear. All the korbanot, meaning all of the tfilot, the sacrifices, will not help fix your sins if you don't follow the Torah, if you don't do chesed, and if you're not modest. You can do whatever you want. You can keep Shabbat and you can learn Torah. But if you're not modest, nothing's going to help you. You can be modest, but if you don't keep Torah, nothing's going to help you. You keep Torah and you can be modest, but you're stingy. You don't want to help people do tshuva. Nothing's going to help you. It's, three, it's all of them or nothing. Why? These are foundations. Foundation of connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? These are His midot. These are his traits when we're supposed to emulate them to prove that we're his children. And that's why the Lubavitch Rebbe Allah Shalom says in the Bat Melech Pnima Sefil, there's nothing Hashem loves more dearly than modesty. And in Beautiful Within, chapter 5, he elaborates further about modesty to make sure that the Benot Israel of today that say that they're connected to him and connected to Chabad understand clearly. He says the, when you're walking around as a woman it's not just enough to wear a skirt. Sometimes women wear skirts it's better off they wear pants because the skirts are so short. Or they're so tight it's better off to just uh, don't leave the house. So the beloved Jerebi in chapter 5 of beautiful within says the knees must be covered even while she's sitting meaning if you're sitting down as a woman and you're wearing a skirt and you have to pull your skirt down it's already too short the skirt needs to be loose fitting but also long enough where it's covering the bottom of your knee six inches below the bottom of the knee according to Allah of Shukhan Aruch according to all the Chachamim after you sit but then he says something amazing and this is the minimum amount that applies to all women this is not ideal don't start wear, buying skirts that are dafka six inches below your knee and think that you're a tzaddika this is the minimum amount not ideal minimum you don't believe me let's continue to see what he says this is the minimum amount but there are places where the minimum amount is not sufficient within regards to tzniut certain places in the world i.e. America full of goyim Certain places where the minimum is not enough. 
and it's necessary to be stringent in according to what the conditions of the location and this doesn't necessarily mean that it's a stringency to be to wear a longer dress but rather the conditions of the place cause the minimum requirement to be longer as a Torah prohibition meaning that the minimum requirement that's minimum is no longer allowed it's a sin to wear a dress right at the bottom of the knee not enough now the minimum becomes a sin you have to wear something longer so for all these girls that only wear skirts that are just below the knee and thinking you're perfect uh, it depends where you are if you're home yeah it's okay you're home other places depends where why because there are certain places you have to be even more modest you are modest now unfortunately you go today to most Chabad houses even the minimum they don't do sometimes even the minimum there's certain rabbis that their own wives I saw with my own eyes Hashem Yishmobi Yatzil live in my neighborhood walking on Shabbat I see the wife what minimum what minimum she doesn't even look Jewish walking next to the head of the Kela. But everybody's harping and focusing on the, 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 the wigs. Okay, forget it. Wear the wigs, don't wear the wigs. What about the rest of your clothes? What about the rest of your clothes? What about the... No, we're Chabad. Yeah, you're Chabad, exactly. That's what I was saying. You're Chabad. You know, Chabad, Nicks, they don't listen to anything that's not Chabad. Okay, I brought you Chabad. No? You tell this to Chabad. Babe. Well, we're going to make a clip out of this to tell it to Chabad. You guys tell Chabad. They already hate me enough. Especially after they watch this. Why? They didn't think we are going to discover their secrets. <laughs> Why did the Lubavitcher Rebbe have such siyata dishmaya to build such a huge organization? Because he was in accordance with the Torah. He was in accordance with the Torah. He, did, he said what he said. That I know that it, what he said. According to the Torah, he didn't call himself Mashiach. He didn't call himself a prophet. He didn't say all these things. And the issue of the whole wigs being Abu Dazara wasn't uh, known at that time anyway. So the point is, Rabutai, many people say many things in the name of Tzadikim that are simply false. That's why it's important for us to look for ourselves. See for ourselves with our own eyes. What did they say? What did they write in a book? If it's not in a book, it's a waste of time. A Baal Tshuva, a convert, or even someone that's been from his entire life. If you want to grow, you have to go search for it. You have to go search for the truth. As if you've never seen it before. Because whatever you've done so far is not enough. You have to do more. You have to learn more. Be'ezat Hashem, this will motivate us to learn more, to do more, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to serve Him like all of the tzaddikim that served Him. And Be'ezat Hashem, get more of His children to come back to Him when Mashiach finally arrives. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.